There we go. Okay. So on the form to figure out what day everybody wanted to do it, I just took everybody's questions and hit them all in this lecture. So if there's something that you don't have questions on and we want to skip, we can skip it. Okay. So we'll just start at the very beginning. What were your biggest hurdles? Like what was the hardest part? Um, mine was just the terminology. I mean, it's just like sandbox and um, yeah. um, um, and not having any help and me being a person that is, you know, technology is not my thing anyway. I mean, it would be like somebody dropping, and, you know, me in the middle of. Uh, I think we all kind of felt like the forest and expecting me to get out, and I have no tools. Right. I mean, I, I, I know nothing. I don't have a compass. I don't have a, a water or anything. I'm, I'm just. And then he did try to have a workshop, but the poor guy gets there, and immediately people are asking how, well, where do, where do you let the import and outport, and can we do this and can we do that? I just need to freaking log on. Right. Yeah, you know, we needed more uh, kind of like, you know, let's start how, here. How the heck do you log on? And then you kind of have a page, and then you, I mean, it, it's just overwhelming for somebody like me. Yeah, and the terminology is different in every district, in every group. Um, I noticed I joined a lot of different Facebook groups for Canvas, and like, one person might call it a sandbox, one person might call it an unpublished course, somebody else might call it something else. And all the different terminology makes it hard because you can't follow along with, if you don't know the vocab, you can't follow along with the story. And that, I think a, a lot of the problem for a lot of us was that, it was, what? <laughs> you know, um, you said this, but I don't know what that means. So, Marcia, did you have anything that was like major or was it just No, like, I was just going to law. I had an alley. Like yeah, and that's hard too because if you've used Canvas as a student, you're not going to see the stuff that goes on behind. So Ali probably would have been a little lost too. But it was just here, figure it out on your own. Don't, it, but you know, we don't work summer. You know, like, and I think that was a lot of frustration for a lot of people. So one of the problems we, um, oh yeah, sorry, there was a few slides. So one of the problems we had in our building was figuring out how to manage these time for it. Like Kim was making videos, but she was here eight hours a day all summer long, like nonstop. And I would say, like for me, what worked better was just setting boundaries with the kids and saying, no, this is when it's due, this is what it is. And if I answer you after that, consider it a miracle and you're blessed from the Lord that I answered your email at 1039 or whatever. Um, it worked for me and communicating in Canvas, using that inbox feature in Canvas to communicate with parents worked really well for me because my administrators could see what I was doing. If I sent it just from my email, then it, it was tracked through my email and that was fine. What do you say your so, administrators call them? But on the admin panel, they can see the emails back and forth with the parents and they can see like, okay, but, you know, Susie. Yeah, I didn't do that. I just, I just did reception. Yeah. And in elementary, you guys use Dojo, and that helps in there. But in our building, yeah. you know, they're like too big for Dojo, so to speak. And so, oh, um, know what Dojo is. It's an email, thing. basically. Um, but that helped me because then when a parent came in, where and they is, were livid. Where is that? On yeah. Here? Perfect. Let's take a look. You go to your. So let's pull up our canvas here. I know how to do that. You know, how, <laughs> right? So there's this little guy right over here to the left that looks like a, I don't know, Inbox. tray, kind of. Okay, yeah. And um, if you click on that, this is where you can see all of your stuff that you've interacted with kids. You can sort it by your courses. So if you have multiple courses, you can figure out like, you know, who, who's got what. You can see what you've sent, and it tracks it in their side too. Okay. So it tracks what responses I'm getting from parents. And so when, when I had issues with, with my virtual students, was the parents had terrible attitudes. And they would come in and be like, well, you never blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, I'll just take a look, see here, over here in this little doodad. I did. And it was nice when, um, when I was quarantined and parents were coming in 
to tell Karen I wasn't doing anything and I wasn't talking to them. I'm like, well, first of all, I'm sick, so what do you want? But second of all, um, yes, I was. Here it is. And she could see it without having to call me, without having to look at anything. She could say, no, you were warned about eight times about that deadline, you know. Um, and that was one of the features that I used a lot. I also used a lot the um, email all students who have option for collecting in final stuff. So it may not apply for you guys, but for example, if I went to, um, let's pick a course, I could go to my grade book. Even though I don't show my grades to my students, I can still use that feature. So I would go to grades every Sunday morning because my stuff was due Sunday night at midnight, click on this little guy and then message all the students who hadn't turned in their work. And I could see, like, they haven't turned in yet. I hadn't graded them. They scored less than a certain amount. I could even do scored more than a 90% and tell them, congratulations, you worked really hard. I'm proud of you. I didn't do those as much. It was more like, hey, by the way, T minus 12 hours till your work is due. Um, and a lot of the parents were getting those notifications, which was nice because then the parent could automatically see, like, well, you haven't done your work. Miss Wilders doesn't have it. And sometimes they'd side with me and make their kid do their work. That was nice. Didn't always happen, but sometimes. Um, as far as content goes, though, don't recreate the wheel. If it's good enough to send to the copier, it's good enough to put on your campus. If it's a good enough worksheet, you would use it in your standards three years ago in what my kids like to call the before times content, then, um, then it's still good. You know, if you we'll get there. So don't undo that. But you can also automate quite a bit and get familiar with quizzes and speed grader to help you reduce your work. Um, I really like it because if I need to be gone, I can do it at home. And I didn't have to spend near as much time this year in my classroom away from my family. I was able to do a lot more work at home. And for my family, if mom is working, but she's sitting on the couch and she's hanging out with us watching a movie while she's working, it's not as big of an insult to them as if I were up here. And that made a difference for my family, but, you know, every family's different. On, on quizzes, I, I didn't do anything with quizzes. And They're hard. My, my kids would do that. But let, let's just pretend, and I'm not going to do it next year because I, I think we're going to get new ELS and I'm not going to spend 40 100 hours on one test, but if I wanted to, um, is that hard to do? No. Okay. I mean, you, you don't, don't have to do it right now. Right. It's just time consuming. It is time consuming in the front end of it. Okay. So uh, it is time consuming because you're basically remaking the worksheet, but you're remaking it once, and it's going to grade it for years to come. I might do that the next year uh -huh. because, because, uh, like I say, if we get new. I don't want to do that. Yeah, and if you know your curriculum's coming up in the next couple of years, I, I honestly think I'd do it. But, um, but for me, we just got new ELA books, and so I was able to do, you know, yeah, about to set it, forget it for another ten years, probably. You know, so for me, it was, it's kind of like a crock pot. You're cutting up all your stuff, you're getting it yeah. ready. It's a pain in the butt the night before, but you put it in there, and then the next day it's all done. And then you've got leftovers, you know. So it, it kind of works that way, but it's a pain up front. And what I felt the most frustrated with was that I had already done all of that for Google Classroom my first two years of teaching. So I had to say, okay, year three is supposed to be so much easier, right, guys? It's going to get better to my family. And then turn around and go, just kidding, we're starting over, you know. And, and for my family, they weren't, you know, it was a hard balance at home. And reconciling that I'm going to have to redo two years worth of work just to put it in the camp. You know, it, it was a real kick in the teeth. But we can figure it out. So what do you want to keep for next year and what do you want to trash? Like, is there something that you're like, this really works on Canvas and I want to make sure that I keep doing it? Or was it all trash and it's, was it just a dumpster fire? Well, there, I mean, for me, it was just the first several, le the first, probably nine lessons um, I'd, I'd like to throw away, but I'm not going to because, again, if we're going to have a new series, I'm 
in that film to Jeffrey Lightning. But right. after that, I started putting, I started doing, uh, um, shows? Mm -hmm. Not PowerPoint. Yeah. For less than me. And um, I think my, I think those online kids like those better than just to read from the text. I mean, basically, I didn't do this, but basically it's taking a picture of my teacher's manual, uploading it, and putting mm -hmm. it in for the parents to teach their kids. This is right. how to teach their kids. Now, I didn't do it that way. I did. But um, after the first 15 lessons, then the next 10 got done that way. And right. The next five <laughs> didn't. I think it's fair to say that, like, our first few weeks were all kind of like, well, Here's what I got. And then we kind of, you know, get in a groove and you figure out, like, this well, and, and then the other thing, and I don't know if this is something I want to talk about right now, but the other thing is I did everything. I didn't do anything. Nothing is in Google. Everything is in my Word document. Mm -hmm. Well, that's okay. Okay. Fine. Word works and it serves its own purpose. And then the Word and the Microsoft Suite keeps it private to you. And it makes it your user item, and it um, it requires you to be in the same place. So there's you know that that issue of it. Um, but when you use Google, it gives you the the cloud base, so you can access it anywhere. But each has their own features that makes it worthy. I'm not very well versed in Word because everything I've done is through Google. Right. Um, and, and but I like can. everything Google because yeah. then I could, like when I was a student, I could do write my essay on my phone while the kids were talking. Sure. And so I needed that mobility. And I don't think, I mean, for little kids, it's just a little, I mean, yeah, a little different. You yeah. Know, just, but I kind of got in trouble for not having things on Google. That makes sense. Well, this is why I put everything in Google. Well, okay. well that what, what, what works for one person doesn't work for another too, you know? So, and then I cried. <laughs> and I did. There were definitely a lot of tears. So how I put everything for reading around spelling and quizzes. Smart. So everything for reading, writing, and spelling could grade itself then. Yeah. Nice. That would be a, a smart way to go. I don't know how to do I don't know how to do a spelling assessment on a quiz. That would be helpful. But again, this this next year I'm just gonna kinda do things the same. Mm -hmm. And then if we get a new quiz in, then I can check in to you know, we'll see what they have. Yeah, and I can check in with my new class and stuff like that. I think even your spelling, you could probably start out with that and kind of, you know, because the spelling words aren't going to be that different. Yeah. But how do you get kids to, to the spelling class, though? Yeah. But um, there are a couple ways. Ethan started doing his online, and so we can talk about like okay. how he, he did those in just a second. Okay, so when we started, it was just like, super overwhelming and it was like, okay, so we gotta make this home page and these people have these bitmoji things and it's all cute and I don't know what that is. Yeah. And do we have to have that? And no, not at all. And using Google with Canvas, there are a lot of different ways to do that. You can, um, the fourth grade team for Ethan's side used a lot of the Google LPI where it would embed automatically. I didn't care for that, so I just did my own thing. Um, so I just got what what I did and what worked for me. I couldn't figure out the LPI thing. And frankly, I I had reached the same point that everybody else had. And that was one too many things to learn. Okay. And I was done with it. So we'll start with how to make a home page. So you can start by do you want to make one or no? We can make one together um, or we can just blow through it real quick. Um but I'll need it for next year, right? So you can. Yeah. Um, okay. So go to Google Drive. Uh -huh. So we start by opening up your Google Drive, and then we're going to open up slides from there. Okay, just one second. Sure. Okay, so now I'm here. I think let's see, and this is where. Yeah, you're good. We're gonna go step by step. So now, if you're in your drive, so we're at a Google page, and we want to go to Drive. So. So we call in my classroom we call it the waffle, everybody calls it something different. Um sometimes we call it the Rubik's Cube, but this is the design for this is called the Google Drive. This okay. is where this is your Google access. Okay. So 
So your drive is the one that looks like it was sideways. Okay. okay. So we're going to want to go to the little drive triangle here. And that's where everything is stored. I tell the kids, this is well, like the... when you were with me, we, we did, we started it small and I just, and then cut it here. So what, um, I tell the kids, Google Drive is like telling your mom something. So when you tell your mom you need toilet paper, it just magically comes, you know, and you tell your mom, hey, I need toothpaste, and then magically the next day there's new toothpaste. Okay. Google Drive is your mom of the internet. Right. So it's going to store everything you've done. I know, really. Even if your whole Chromebook dies, I don't even, I don't even remember putting it up there. Right? Like that. Um, or even if some jerk kid comes by and starts your Chromebook and it locks you out, it's going to save it. So it's like the mom. It remembers everything. So anything you do there is going to save for you. You don't have to keep starting over. You can come back and find it again. But we're going to click on New over here on the left. And this is how you'd want to start any anything new that you were going to do, a slide, a presentation, a doc, whatever. Um, but coming from the word perspective, docs is like Word, Sheets is like Excel, okay. so and Slides is PowerPoint. So a Google Slide is just like a PowerPoint. It's a PowerPoint okay. stored on the cloud. Okay. So it works almost exactly the same. Um, PowerPoint has some different features than Slides, but for the most part, what Google wanted to do was exactly mirror what Microsoft was doing and take their mind. Okay. And so, um, Basically, they went, okay, Microsoft has Word, we need Docs, or, okay, oh, that's what they did. That sort of thing. So they wanted to go back and forth and have exactly the same stuff, but Google branded. So if you're wanting to do a Word document, then you can choose Google Docs. And you don't have to go in to all of your Word documents and retype them in Google Docs. There's a way to convert them. So don't feel like no, I gotta go do this. You can drag and drop. It takes just like a ridiculous amount of time because you have to do each one individually. Okay. But if you sit down with a nice glass of iced tea on the patio, it's a good effort. Um, so we're gonna start by clicking on Google Slides and using the blank presentation. And that'll get us to this screen. And this is where you're gonna build the images you want on your home page. I use Google Slides to make my homepage because it's the closest thing to Microsoft Publisher that Google has. And so for me, that's the easiest to use. It's the easiest to draw in and move my stuff around and, and make things the way I want to. But this is where you build the images you want in a homepage. It does take a little bit of practice, but once you get the hang of it, it's like, boom, boom, boom. You know, knock them out real fast. So, this is the button that we use to do the text box. So if we want to add text to it, we want to take away text, all of that sort of thing. And this one adds an image. When you click on that image, you can search the web right there and find an image. You don't have to go Google it and then try to figure out how to save that picture and then put it anywhere else, which a nice feature over PowerPoint. They don't have that option. It's hard. It's hard. But um, I do search the web and then I find whatever I have done. So, um, so now you just kind of make the page your own. You can do like different backgrounds, different put your stuff in. Um, so where did the Bitmoji come in? The Bitmoji is a pain, but it comes in. Let me get back to my page here. And what if I just want to just use the same one as I did last year? You can absolutely do that. Okay. So I changed mine up each week because I was hyperlinking their assignments. In. So I only started doing that in the second semester because I was sick and tired of kids. Well, it wasn't in my to-do list. Wasn't it? You know, yeah. And I told my kids, like, the to-do list was just a don't list because it wasn't working for my kids. It was not shoving them what they needed to do. Um, so I wanted my kids to go through modules or calendars. So I basically made this a clickable link where they could just jump right to what they needed to do every day. Um, it was a pain, but 
now I've got it done for a full month. I just saved it like week one, week 36, whatever, and I can reload it. So my Bitmoji, I set mine up so that I can just drag it and drop it. Um, I mean, it, it works, but you can also save your Bitmoji and paste it there too. So either way, there's a couple ways to go about that. But this is one of mine. This is just the regular schedule where I posted the wrong schedule for the testing for about three weeks. That was pretty fun. Um, you can see all of your home pages in this pages tab. So I want to show you how to do that. You can go to view all pages. And this will so, show you. So go back to Canva. Yeah. Okay. And where pages? Okay. Pages, pages are, and then view all pages. Okay. And then where? Sure. Okay. This is where I would put. Um, oh, you got one one. Even if it's not marked as available to your students, you can still do it, whatever you need. Oh, okay. So, in mine, I've got all these pages. This is where I was putting, like, um, here's a bingo card or uh, the hoops for semester test, that sort of thing. Anything where I just wanted to, I didn't want to give it as an assignment. I didn't want to assign points to it, oh, so but I wanted them to have access to it. Okay. Yes. So, this is like, this one links. Um, all of these go to a Kahoot. They can play on their own to practice for their semester test okay. or information like that. Okay. Um, but here's. If I want to try to do Kahoot, so I have to share or try to do it. Right. Try to do it, period. Right. This is kind of. Um, let's see. I think this one works. Okay. So here's an example of one of them. This was just like. When they landed on my home page, this is what they would see. And within that, I had linked it so they could say, okay, well, it's Wednesday. What am I supposed to do at school or whatever? They could tap that, and it would open up a new tab oh, with okay. exactly their assignment. Okay. So it gave them, like, if you can't find your assignment, I don't know if I can help you. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, and it gave them that. But I also used the due dates feature. So I'm going to scroll down to that. And I used. Yeah, I know how to do that. Here. Yeah. Yeah. And why I did that was so that they could go to their calendar every day. Okay. Yeah. And even though my students <laughs> always had until Sunday night at midnight to turn in their stuff. Right. You were thrown up on Wednesday, fine. You got till Sunday to turn. Exactly. Yeah. But they could go to their calendar and say, okay, my class for Miss Woolridge for third hour is yellow. So I'm going to make sure I've done each of those tasks. Okay. That's how it worked for me. Um, but everybody was doing something different. So it works for me to say, well, what day of the week is it? Okay, well, what are you supposed to do today, you know? Gotcha. Um, it, it worked okay. I mean, it wasn't the best, but it did. It was better than the to-do list because what I found was the to-do list was pulling up stuff that maybe we did it in class. Yeah. And my second hour really loved having a paper worksheet. So if they were an in-person student, it would show all the stuff in their to-do list that they didn't need to do gotcha. because yeah. we had done it in person. I did a to-do list. Yeah, so I in a, a weekly to do list, and it, it, it was different than my on it was different than my regular classroom kids. So, um, and it, and then it just you know, and then there were things that developed after that that I think I learned. Right. Like well, I need kind of learn a little bit. Tuesday way. and Thursday, I would just they would knit math, mm -hmm. and on Wednesday on Wednesdays it was usually a reading and a grammar. Yeah. So I'm not grading every single day. Right. And, and then, in and Fridays were assessment. That's nice. In our setting, it's more like every class is submitting something right. every day. Yeah. And even if I didn't want to give a grade for it, everything, like I'm only going to take so many grades a week. Right. But I'm going to have them turning in something. So that you can tell. Them. So that I can see that they're following along. Just right. like in class patients and in class students, I'm going to say like, you know, I'm going to ask questions, see if they're getting along or right. That's why I hid my grades in Canvas. Because parents were saying, well, they did this and they don't have points for it. Well, no. Because if I put does not count towards final grades, you're not going to do it. Yeah. 
Well, and that was one of my bigger issues with, with the grade stalkers. With Paige, that was kind of, I was a grade stalker. Yeah, it's hard to balance and he, that. You would get zeros, and I'm like, why in the heck do you have a zero here? Right. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't a zero. Uh, yeah, it's hard. And um, what I ended up doing for my Canvas gradebook stalkers was to go in and just mark it complete or incomplete for those kind of things. And um, complete in class was a common copy paste for me. Completed in class, completed in class. And it was annoying. It was like trying to keep up with two gradebooks. I want to find a better answer for that, but I'm not sure what that is yet. Because even though they couldn't see the grade, in Canvas, I've got my grades turned off. They could see it in their to-do list as it wasn't done. And parents were saying like, but this is in your to-do list. And, you know, little Holden was saying, well, mom, we did it. We did it in class. And and when you're in middle school, nobody believes you. Yeah. Nobody. And nobody should believe you yeah. because you're in middle school. Right. Yeah. And they were struggling with that. And so eventually I kind of got it figured out, like, which kid really needed me to make sure I put something in their Canvas and which kid I could, you know, and not do. I only got it figured out, but it was a, a little trial and error along the way for that. But once you get this set up, you can put whatever you want on there. You can make it be your home page. You can make it be your weekly page like I did. You can even, um, this is where I put my worksheets because it was the easiest for me. My kids are using a lot of mobile devices, and slides works the best on a mobile device out of the options. It's not awesome but it's the best of what we had and so that's why I chose to do it that way because I would have a lot of kids that didn't want to be virtual kids didn't have devices at home don't have internet access at home but got quarantined or would be you know oh well I've got stomach flu and I would say well works on canvas do it you know or leave for a vacation yeah or take off for vacations for a week or whatever it is that they were going to be called and so that gave me the option to give them the virtual um, things they could do from their phone. Like I had one multimedia kid who went on vacation. Well, I put everything on slides. There's no excuse not to do it. You can do it on your phone on the airplane. I mean, there's no reason. So for me, having that Google Slides gave me an out. I could not, I didn't have to deal with like, well, he doesn't have his worksheets with him or he lost his worksheets on vacation. Or whatever. I, did, I did all of my worksheets. They were uploaded. Yeah. And once you do that, and you get a handle on it, you can kind of make it your own, your own thing. And it, it, sometimes it's fun. Sometimes it's not. It depends on what you're doing, you know. I know how to embarrass. I know how to do that. Okay. So when it's when my slides are ready to share and I'm ready to do that, I publish it to the web and just embed that HTML code. That sounds super scary, but really you're just copying and pasting the wording that goes with it. So you like control C to copy it. And nothing obvious happens, which is terrifying. And then you go to your pages and click on this little guy and pop it in there. So it's kind of scary for a minute. And then you notice um, a lot of times we were having trouble with the black bar showing up above and it was driving everybody nuts that the black bar was like huge yeah. above everything. And so you get to be a coder you can go in to find where it says 3,000 and type in and RM equals minimal. I don't know what that means. But if you type it in there, your little black bar goes away for the most part. 3,000 and the symbol. The and symbol. And then RM, Roger Mary, equals minimal. Like as in, I would like to do minimal work. So that works for me, but it's annoying and I'm like, I get real irritated because, like at home, if I'm working on it, that's about the same time that my dog decides it's a good time to jump on the couch, and then I redo the whole code, and you know how my life is. Okay. So that's kind of how those things work for me. But that's what I do to put it in there, and you press save to see your work. And then if you want that to be the first thing your students see, it's published now, and you just go in and click the little dot and say, use this front page. So I made all my pages for like several weeks once I had my lesson plans figured out. And then I would go in, sit down like one Sunday afternoon, make a bunch of them. And then all I'd have to do each Monday morning is put it as front home page. The only problem I had with that was the students that wanted to start their day before I did. And they'd be like 6 a.m. on Monday morning. Hey, our stuff isn't posted yet. The how I know my day doesn't start till 9.30. 
<laughs> um, instead of having the, the first plan, I guess. So. so that was really my only issue with that. So worksheet-wise, it sounds like Marcia, you figured out quizzes, which is a lot easier than putting your worksheets in. Um, if you can figure out quizzes, you figure out worksheets, so I just made copies and emailed it. That was it. Okay, gotcha. Um, there are some worksheets that you really need them to do the actual worksheet for, especially in an ELA format like reading, writing, spelling, or things like that. Um, in my history class, worksheets are true, false, A, B, C. That's an easy put it on quizzes. But when I want them to do a brainstorm, or I want them to do like a flow chart of the plot, then I really need them to do the worksheet. And doing that in quizzes is hard. So this is why I use Google Sheets to help me, or slides to help me with that. But this was kind of my mantra to myself all, all year. Like if it was good enough to run it through the copier and waste paper on it, then it had to be good enough for Canvas. So um, instead of running it through the copier and making a copy, there's a scan feature on the copier machine. Yeah. Yeah. So you scan it and send it to your own email. Then it comes up and you get a really fun little email that says, from Dee Nickley. So you get yeah. to remember Deborah a little bit. And you can go to your email and save it. We'll walk through that in just a second. I've got, I've got that part. Got that part figured yeah, out? That, that is half the battle. That's the only thing that I have. I'm good at that. Okay, but you got I half the battle with that. You can do that with my phone now. Yes. So my phone has this really cool feature, and it's a I Samsung. It and, and I can yeah. hold it over, do that. I don't even have to leave my seat to do it. And, and that's awesome. I mean, as much as I hate all of this, but I have learned to use, you know, my phone and other means where I needed to, things to speak in or, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. So, I mean, yeah, but I can do that. That's it has its cool. benefits, and it has its drawbacks. I So to save a worksheet, you can snap a photo with your phone, share it to your drive, or you can send it to a copier. What I do is I just take a picture of it with my phone and save it to my school drive because my school email is on my phone. So if my school email is on my phone, then everything I have in my drive is on my phone. But if you're using a copier, you just send it to yourself and then you've got it in your email there. And once you have it saved in your drive, this is where we go back to slides. And this is where we make our worksheets. But all of our worksheets are 8 by 10. All of our slides are 16 by 9. That's a problem. But we can even do it So we need to do a few things to make sure our students can write. The first thing I do is go to page 7 and make it be the right size because it drives me nuts if it's not the right size. So this is my first step. But you can go into the file menu and then choose page setup, and you can change this to be whatever size you want. So if you've got something that you really, really, really want your kids to create this awesome thing on legal size paper, you can make it 11 by 14. Or if you really want to print this out and have, have each kid put it together and it makes one giant project, you can do that too. And that's pretty cool. But I always flip it to 8 by 10. Now, technically, your school paper is 8 and a half by 11, but if you go 8 by 10, you've got ponchos, you're fine. So, that's what I do to make it the same size as my worksheet. Then I'm going to choose background for my toolbar. Then I'm going to take my image. Now you can do background and do it um, just as a color and do different things with that. I, on this part, would choose an image and then I find my image from my drop. Okay. So I'm going to choose image and it gives me options do like search the web, um, Google your drive, upload from your computer. So if you're uploading from your computer because it was a Word document, that's an easy way to do that. Um, I choose an image and then it goes to my Google Drive tab. Oh, here it is. Um, and I find the image I've saved and double click on it. You can click it and then hit select and all those fun things, but just double click is a thousand times faster. So once I've done that, I've made my worksheet. So here's, this is like a plot diagram, okay? And I want my students to be able to type on it. Whatever they add to this worksheet is not gonna change my background. So whatever pencil drawing they make on it, anything like that, it's not gonna change the physical paper that they have. Just like if I gave 
uh, max a worksheet and Ethan comes along and draws on Max's worksheet, he's still got the same worksheet. So in this, students can add their own text boxes. I added them for my kids because they were struggling enough with their stuff. And I didn't want to watch them struggle. But all I did to do that was click on this little guy right here. And then I went in and drew a little box everywhere I wanted them to type. Okay. It takes a little bit, but again, it's one of those <laughs> doing it up front makes it so much easier than trying to teach a student who barely so has time to turn on from the okay, It doesn't have a, a chart you can put in a chart. You can put in whatever you want. Okay. So, we, so um, anything that you want to put in here, if you want to add a chart to it, you can just go to insert and, and pop in whatever you want. So for me, I've given them, once I send them this paper, uh -huh. this is the same as me giving them the physical worksheet. Exactly. And when I put in those text boxes, it allows them to put their pencil digitally on there and type in what they want to say. So they can click, like, let's say they're ready to answer in this box. If I've got my text box on it, they click and the cursor appears, the little clicky mouse guy. All they got to do is hit start typing. So, so I'll put all the stuff in Cammy at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, Cammy was a bum deal because we were under the impression Cammy was going to be free and available to us, and then it wasn't, and it was a rough go with that. And they're coming out, Canvas has come out in the last week with an annotation tool where students are going to be able to annotate right in there, so we might, this may become obsolete by this time next year. But I haven't figured it out yet, so I didn't want to, you know, like, I got to learn it so I can teach it. But, um, I mean, that's certainly something to look at, the Kami annotation tool, if you're wanting to spend some time Googling and figuring it out. This worked for me this year. It's probably going to be the next year. Because all my worksheets are done. And I don't want to spend the whole summer behind a computer again. I've already done that for several years. And I've already watched my kids from the sidelines at Whitewater doing my homework and writing essays. I don't want to do it again. So that's just kind of where I'm at with it. But once you do that, they can type right on it and they have, have their worksheet. We want to make sure that they can see it. That was my biggest hurdle um, with the kids that were virtual because they weren't logging in using their school email. They have got to log into Canvas using their school email to have access to everything. Um, They've got to know how to do that. It's hard for it is super hard for second graders because they're logging into mom's computer. Mom's already got it set up on her Google. And then what happens for us is that, so well, they did their work, but it's not in their student drive. Well, yeah, because it's in mom's drive, you know, and and um, that has has to be something we front load with our kids that when you are logging into a computer, you've got to go to Google and find it. Um, if they're using a school Chromebook or anything here at school, it's going to force them to log in that way. So if they're here on campus, it's already done. It's a solved problem. But when they're working on their own, it's something we've got to force them to do. So we want to click on the, the orange share button in the top right corner, and then this list will pop up, and we want to change the link to Dale Public Schools. And that way, anybody who's logged into their at Dale account can see it. And then um, your copy of the worksheet is automatically saved in your drive. So you've got your copy. We just need to push a copy to the student. So you've got your original. Now we're ready to make copies for the kids. So share your link with your student. I go into the instructions for my Canvas assignment. Like for me, I, I will go to Canvas, make an assignment, tell them what to do, and it'll say, like, click this link for the worksheet, mm -hmm. and I hyperlink it there because that's what's easy for me. Um, it's easy when I paste the link that I copied in the last step, but at the end, I have to do a little bit of tweaking. Otherwise, they're all working on the same worksheet. So, we find one right quick. So, let's see. What did I give them that they could do that with? Okay, so like here's a 
a worksheet that we did. And I would say, make a copy of these slides or make a copy of this worksheet or whatever. Then when the students are clicking that, it pushes them to make a copy of it. That basically tells them, okay, when you're ready, go get your worksheet off the table over here, go to your worksheet, but digitally. So it would make them make a copy of it. And how that looks on our end is that when I was putting in that link, This is what the link looks like when you copy and paste it in there. Mm -hmm. It's a whole bunch of gobbledy. Right. And at the end, it'll say edit when you paste it. Where I've got copy here, yeah. when you automatically paste it, it says like edit and okay. a couple little gobbledy doobie things. You want to delete that all the way back out to that slash and we'll completely remove the word edit and type in the word copy. Okay. Switch your edit to copy and that's what makes the kids their own copy. So that's a pain. But it keeps them all from writing on the same worksheet. If you don't switch it, it's not the end of the world, but they're all going to write on your copy of it. If you just copy and paste that original link, it gives them all your original paper, and we want them to all have a copy of it. But once you've done that, each kid has to make their own copy. If it's something that the kids are coming back and forth and working on, they'll want to go to their drive to open it up from there on out, like if it's a journaling type thing. Right. Um, because every time they click this slides, if it's like, oh, I was working on it at school, but um, now I've got to finish it at home. When they go to finish it at home, we have to train them to go through drive. Okay. Otherwise, they're open. It's like getting a new copy of the worksheet. <clears throat> For my kids, it didn't take very long to, to sort that out. But this is also where it's important to collaborate with others because fourth grade had it nailed with this LTI thing. And theirs might have been a lot easier, and it might have been not changing the code. I don't know. I that was not my jam. So it's what's familiar to me. It's easier to me to just change the text at the end and roll on. But before you make your worksheet, can it grade itself? If it's something that you would pass on to your Tutor Tuesday person and say, "Here's the key, grade it," then it definitely can be a worksheet. So quizzes. We, we joke all the time that like it's the second half of our life because our kids can be left at home by themselves. So quizzes is kind of like that. That moment when everybody is potty trained at your house and you can do your own thing and you don't have to throw a dice with that anymore. Because it reduces your grading. It gives you options to do multiple choice, true, false, and word bank. And if, even if you're getting to the point where you want this sentence type exactly the way you have it like capital letters and punctuation are what you're grading for. You can even use it for those. Um, I don't very often because my kids are still learning to type and their little fingers just don't do it. But you could. You can still choose to grade your own and you can still choose to grade your written responses. So if you've got a worksheet that's like mostly multiple choice with a couple of written responses, I toss those down at the bottom, scroll down, read it, toss in a couple of points and go um, it gets pretty quick when you start figuring out how to use SpeedGrader, and there's one little button that moves it all over to your window. So you're no longer looking at what was my SpeedGrader grade in one window, click over and put it in my Wingate. You can sync it up, this came about around Christmas, that you can push it straight to our Wingate and not have to do grades. So there's not. It eliminates a lot of grading. So if you go to your module where you want the quiz to be, and you're going to click the plus button. I'm just going to go to this to the top. Okay. Um, and then choose a quiz, and then you're going to create new. Now, this button will pop up right now with new quizzes or classic quizzes. You're going to want to use new quizzes even though it's worse. So this, this is new. Okay, so I'm going to go. And then in the add box, we we'll change it from assignment to quiz. Oh, that's nice. Okay. Okay. And then create quiz. Okay. Okay. And then right here. That's just going to see how you align it in your module that you can change that. Okay. All right. So I go from there, I hit create quiz. Okay. Classic quizzes was the first interface that we got. It was what it looked like when we started out in August. 
And over the year, Canvas pushed out new quizzes. New quizzes is supposed to be amazing because it's going to give us all these moderation options. I haven't gotten there with it yet. I'm still learning to like it. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. So Go like, ahead. Wait, we'll see. So like right here, say I opened up my phone to think I and said that I don't do this quiz here. Do I? No. But this would be a good opportunity to make to make that choice. But if you do, but you can't do. I couldn't do all. Um, do what I'm saying like. Um, um, do what I'm saying like um, mm -hmm. module is this is all day five. Right. So all day five is spelled by the tree and grammar, right? Yeah. So, so you'd want to do like a different quiz for your grammar test. Right. And a different quiz for your right. phonics test. Oh, okay. Because that jot down menu is there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's okay. Okay. So the format right now with new quizzes is not very user friendly, but classic quizzes is going to fade out over the next year. So we want to get familiar with it so we're not having to undo stuff. Um, if you have things, in classic quizzes, there's supposed to be a rollover method for us, so we're not typing those all again. I did panic. that. I did that from one semester to and we can uh -huh. just your opinion if we're gonna change curriculum, do you think that's something that we need to do? Or I'd wait till I got my name person in person. Um I can't imagine spending that. But when time. I say stuff yesterday, am I gonna be able to use that? Semester, because we mm -hmm. I don't know how to do that at semester. You know, we had the. Mm -hmm. I had I just remarked everything. Oh no, we so don't have to do that. Now. So yes, I'll show you at the end how to move everything over. So once we get this set up, we've got our, our quiz name. This is what we're doing. Um, once you complete the previous screen and hit save, it redirects you back to your module, and it'll tell you this chapter eight test is what I was doing for history. It'll show you this, but it's not published yet. It's not green yet. I gotta click on the quiz name and go fill out all my gobbledygook. But it'll say on these new quizzes that it's an external tool. I don't know why. They don't know why. They just don't. So you just kind of ignore that section. And we're gonna check this magic box that says sync to SIS, Retro School Information Systems. It took me a while to figure out that one. But that's what's going to pull it to Wingage. It won't pull it automatically. So like the second that Libby finishes her test, it's not going to pull it automatically over. It does everything at a midnight refresh. So the next day, it's in there. It's handy when you can do a multiple choice and you don't have to go back and look at something. Um, like my semester test grades were all done this way. So I was ready to go like Thursday afternoon because I had everything refreshed um, at midnight and I was good to go. So that, that's why my room is actually back in here. So in this, you want to make sure you're giving super simple instructions, like complete this test, hit submit, kind of like at least the first few times out. This is your navigation menu over here on the left, and that's, you can go from, you know, like, oh, I forgot, question number one, I needed to finish this, or I realized, I left the period out of it or whatever. You can navigate back and forth there between the questions. So once you add questions, you'll see more numbers pop up there. So this is where we want to give our instructions for the whole quiz, like you may not use your notes. It doesn't matter, they're going to anyway. But just say you may not, and then cover your butt. Anytime you see a pencil, that's where you want to go to edit something. So anything with a pencil is well, erase and make a change. And then we'll click this little guy here to add our question. So when we add a question, we get this stuff. And this is where the nerds get excited. So the piggy bank is what stores all your questions. It saves it in a, in a um, quiz bank is what they call it. So all those questions that you've been typing for like the whole unit about and water and the water cycle, if you've been using those on worksheets the whole unit and you're ready to give a test, you can go to your quiz bank and then pick questions you've already given. So if you have to create your own test, it's really handy for that. The outcomes can help you track standards. I haven't figured that out yet. It's on my budget list, but it's pretty far now. Um, 
But you can also choose different, really different answer options for each of the questions. You can even add a signal, which is where like you're going to include a reading passage, or here's this passage and each sentence is numbered, which sentence doesn't belong. That's where you want to add those things. So um, if you're putting in like a math chart or a graph that you want your students to look at, that's where you want to put that in that standard part. Um, I most often use multiple choice, true, false, and um, essay. Fill the blank word if it's special. Like you can say, spell the word that means frog, and they would type in amphibian or whatever. You know, so you can give hints or um, use the word in a sentence but leave the sentence blank, leave that word blank. Um, you can try those types of things for your spelling. Um, it just kind of depends on your spelling, like how you want to do it. You know, like this is the color of think how much paper we can save. <laughs> yeah, and think of how much grading we can save because I know spelling tests are quick to grade, but this is quicker. So we're gonna do it. Um, there are a couple of ways that I do my answers. Really, if I'm looking at like spelling, um, I might do it like I type in my answer with a capital letter with a lowercase letter. But if I'm grading for spelling, I'm looking at like the exact. Um, some of the issues that that I run into is like I want them to say Stonewall Jackson, but they put in like Captain Stonewall Jackson or whatever. Um, that sort of thing. We run into issues with that. So there are times when I do have to go back and look at it. It does give you an option to say exact match or close enough. And I like that option because I'm a close enough teacher. You know, I'm like, okay, that's not exactly the answer I was looking for in history class. It's not word for word within your notes, but I can tell you know what you're talking about. Good enough for me. So I like the close enough option. Uh, here's an example of a question. I, this particular test has 17 matches. So on the test, paper copy, like A through Q of words, and they got to go in and put like A goes with this one. Uh, when I'm doing them, I'm going to like break down in terms of five at the most because they get overwhelmed with all of that. They see all of that and then they just like shut down. And I get it because I was here. So this particular question is going to actually cover five things. So I'm going to make it be worth five points. So down over here, at the bottom of the screen, I can go in and change the point value to be five. So that helps me with my grade. And you know, if you're doing five spelling words there, you want to change it to five or whatever. Otherwise, you look back and you're like, why was that test only worth three points? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because um, you can also have it shuffle the questions if you want to. So. Um, I often do that on multiple choice because I don't want them to be able to look over each other's monitors and say, oh, she put that number. Um, when I scroll down, I can choose that. I can align the outcomes. And this has a cool feature that you can um, click on this and bank the question. So if you're one that uses your worksheets to build your test, that can really help out with that. Um, you can also add distractors too. There's an option up here to do that, which I find handy for this particular thing because sometimes the answers are stupidly obvious. Um, like, I might have a worksheet that's got matching of five things and one person is a dude on the list and then the rest of them are like impeachment or whatever it is. It's just terms. It's really obvious which one is the person. So I like to toss in an extra person every now and then just to mess with them a little bit. Um, this section of my test actually has 17 items, but I like to break it down. So, so that's how I do mine. And then from here, I can still go back and edit it as I need to. If I decide, like, wait, I, I grouped them all in the way that they were to order on my worksheet, but I don't like that, and I want it to be all of the questions about powers. I want to make sure that um, enumerated powers gives them those choice. Then I can go back and change that. As I work, I can go and make sure that things are fixed. I can also see, like, huh, I said I was going to change this to five points, but I didn't. Let me go back and fix that. Whenever you finish, you'll press return in the top right corner. And then it kind of goes away. And you're like, what happened? What happened? Because it freaks me out. So first, you'll be redirected to the module. If you're all done, you're set. You're ready to assign it. 
if you're not done, follow the same steps, get back in the quiz and make changes. So like sometimes when I was first using it, I would hit return thinking like, okay, I'm ready to go to the next thing. I hit enter and it would go away and I would freak out. So it's not a big deal, you get back in. And if you want to moderate and see what your students are doing as they're working on it, but maybe you're trying to moderate what this group is doing, but you're also meeting with students about their writing over here, something like that, you can do those simultaneously. And if you click the SIS linking, overnight your grades will sync with Wingate. So there's no going back to go, okay, they got all these multiple choice ones right, so 49 out of 50, so I've got to go in here. It'll sync it automatically for you, and you don't have to do that. So when you're moderating quizzes, you can quickly see the situation. Now we've, we've talked a little bit about adding to a guardian, which would allow us to see a student's screen, but it's pretty expensive. This is something we've already paid for, so I'm going to show you how to use this just in case. So a few things are going on. So we head back to the quizzes tab in our Canvas course, and then the new quizzes look a little different from any classic quizzes that you might have in there. Like, for example, my chapter 18 is a new quiz, and it's going to be a little solid rocket but my other ones are in classic because I got a result of every time. So there, they have a little clear rocket. So anything you created in classic quizzes are just the outline, but the other guys, the newer ones are going to be a filter. It doesn't really matter. It just gives you kind of an idea of, okay, which ones do I need to convert when we get to that point? Um, second, there's this little checkbox on the right, and this little green guy, the furthest to the right, tells you whether it's been published or not. Also, if it's not published, you won't see the green on that side, on the left-hand side, the little green bar. But if it's been published, the student can access it, they can do whatever. Now, maybe I wanted to go in, I wanted to go ahead and set up my semester test. I want to hit publish because I'm going to leave early for vacation, but I don't want my students to see it yet. That's where those due dates come in to help you fix that. Um, but this little spinning guy just to the left of the text box is magic. So if it's just a little black guy, it's not syncing to your grade book. So if I've got one that I know is a lot of written response, I'm not going to sync that. I'm going to want to go in and see what they have to say. But if I've got one that's a bunch of multiple choice, like these daily worksheets, I click these little boxes and it'll sync it to Wingage for me. I can even do it afterwards, like, oh, crap, I meant to put Tuesdays as the automatic thing so I don't have to go back in and edit those grades. You can retroactively do that and it'll flood over at midnight. It just updates and says, okay, these are the boxes that are checked. Move it over. It doesn't know the difference. So uh, making a green sync the grades to Wingate, and if it's black, you have to input your own grade. But if you want to moderate or change a quiz, you just click on the title of the quiz here to advance to the next screen. Go to the next screen. You'll have that first intro screen here whenever you click on it there. And down at the bottom, you want to hit build to move on to that screen. Once you hit build, which is like, let me in there, this is where you go. This is where you can make changes to your test, change the settings to shuffle the questions, or moderate to see that the kids are, what the kids are doing and who's still working. And whenever you finish here, you can just hit return again. The moderate is cool because it allows me to see who's still working. So this is a sample of the moderate screen. So I can see like, maybe I wanted to give this really quick test and then we were gonna do another activity and I'm trying to decide if I've got time for it. But some of my kids are with Marshall. I can see each kid and what they're working on, where are they at? So like, let's say Cam was still working, his time would show that he was still going and the time keeps moving. So if a student's logged into it last night, and they're still logged into it, I can see how long they've been logged into it. Or if a student blows through it and finishes their semester test in eight minutes and three seconds, Olivia, then I can see like, well, but they only spent eight minutes with it and they made a 10, what do you want? You know, you can kind of look at, well, we've got to learn to take our time or whatever. Um, I like this for that when they're in a different room or whenever they are working virtually, you can kind of see what's going on. The score in this screen is automatically based on 100% skill. That's fine if you teach elementary school, if you're doing on our end where we do like discussion questions, 
in elementary school it'd be worth 100 points and 90 percent then it's one over here we do it it's worth 10 points you've got nine and so um that's why i like the sinking part because that makes it easier when it floods over it does the part as points earned so even though it shows you like uh Celsius was a 90 percent Whenever it floods over, it's going to show like a 9.00 in my language. One chance. The view log hyperlink will allow you to see how long each student spent on each question. And it's also handy because it tracks when a student leaves the test screen. I.e., anytime they open up a new tab to Google the answer, it tells you they left the screen, they left the testing window, they left all these things. So you can actually print out that log and take it to a parent who's complaining about being accused of cheating. And you can say, look, they left the test for 30 minutes. They clearly were going to look for the answer, you know. Um, that helps. And you can add accommodations or extend time or changes to it as well. Like I could give, let's say, you know, Lydia didn't make 100 in the eight minutes. I can moderate, give her a second chance and say, hey, seriously, spend 20 minutes on it. See what happens, you know. Um, so I like that part. I haven't quite figured out accommodations from this point. It's easier for me to accommodate on the test than it is for me to add it here. I worksheets, I guess. I mean, this is what it looks like from the student side. I didn't use quizzes, new quizzes very often, so I've got a lot to convert. But this is a sample of a worksheet that I converted using the new format from a student perspective. So this is a worksheet that would have been true, false for five questions, multiple choice for five questions. So I've put it in as a new quizzes, and this is what the students see. This is kind of see what they see a little bit. And if you entered a whole bunch of stuff in there, don't panic. We'll find it, Marshall. So I had a lot of questions about comments. Do you guys want to go over comments at all? It's basically like free teachers pay teachers, That's but it's a pain. It, it can be a pain because maybe what somebody put on there is not what you would put on there, and you've got to go out and figure out what they're talking about. It To me, it felt more time consuming than it was. Um, but what do we do with the work that we worked on this year? And that's kind of easy, but kind of not. So I hear if we don't do anything, it won't go anywhere. It's supposed to just stay on your Canvas rack. That's not what we're hearing from our administration, which means our IT guys are probably going to do something a little bit different. So we want to move our stuff to a sandbox. And this will let you work on it over the summer. Even though we all say we're not working on the summer, we all know I'm going to go get into it later today because it's just how I am. So this will help you with that. If you're going to move schools or you know, like I'm going to move grades, but I might be moving back to first, like say I taught first grade this year, now I'm going to fourth. And I might go back to first grade someday and I want to save all that. You can export it to your computer and save it on a flash drive so that you would have it to like move around if you needed to. Or if you were moving schools and you didn't want to lose everything you've done, something like that. But for everybody in the room, I think we're just ready to go to a sandbox. So we'll talk about that. So first we're going to do is pick that we want to make it a sandbox. That's what Dale has been calling it is a sandbox. But I mean, because it's just a place to play around with it. Um, some people will call it like a template course or every district calls it something different, which is annoying. But the first thing we want to do is open up our course. Okay, so and Dale, this is where um, I'm kind of confused because I have different courses. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what is my sandbox and what is not. Okay. okay, so if it's published, it's not a sandbox. Okay, so like this, this, these are right here. These are the lessons I've created. Right. Okay, and then you go down here, and then I have no idea what these are. Gotcha. So those. I don't know what those are. Hmm. I have okay. no idea what this is. Yeah. Well, what did you use this year? That's what we want to look for. Okay. So, what I used this year is I used my science. Okay. These are like some science lessons. And, and I, I will work on that over the summer. Okay. Um, and then, um, let's go back to your back. So we know like this, this is very important I can't go there. Okay. This one, this one. Okay. So we want to do is take this. It's very important to can't that I'm not doing this over again. Right. So we want to go down to the settings. Okay. Okay, let's 
long as my other screen did the same thing, copy, paste, and copy, and then the right thing. But do you think I should save theirs just in case? Nope. If theirs was what you did, then that's on them. They gotta make their own copy. Okay. I mean, it's kind of like when I got Karen, I'd run, I had the original, so I would send it to the lady who made copies for us, but it was on them to keep it an original. They want an original. Okay. So like that's that's you, man. That's you. So we can actually count this towards your TLE for next year. So what we can do is we covered a lot today, so we can just wait until the fall and put it in during our um, in service days if you want. But you can count this as part of that, so you don't have to worry about all of that fun stuff.